This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Fairlay. Fairlay is a Bitcoin prediction market where you can place predictions on the likelihood of sporting events, the Bitcoin price, or current affairs. You earn money if your predictions are correct. Head over to fairlay.com slash epicenter, that's F-A-I-R-L-A-Y dot com slash epicenter to place your first bet today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture, and today's episode continues our coverage of the BTC2B conference, which took place in Brussels on October 16th and 17th. So in this episode, we have the final talk of the conference, which was delivered by Nicolas Courtois, who is a well-known cryptographer, codebreaker, as well as a senior lecturer at the University College London. He has over 100 publications, multiple patents, and years of experience working in the smart card industry. In the last few years, Nicolas has shifted some of his time to city in cryptocurrencies. He's authored several papers on Bitcoin and is the author of the so-called Theory of Self-Destruction of Cryptocurrencies. You can find Nicolas' work and writings on his website at blog.bettercrypto.com. So this talk is titled Cryptographic Security of ECDSA in Bitcoin, in which Nikola exposes the security vulnerabilities in the specific variation of the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm used in Bitcoin. In fact, he speculates that Bitcoin will be cracked sometime in 2015. It's a very technically complex talk, but very interesting and opens your eyes to the possibility that the technology that we all use and want to succeed may have some serious security issues. So for those of you who are interested, the link to the slides for this talk will be in the show notes at epicenterbitcoin.com. And you can, of course, read more of Nikola's research on his website at blog.bettercrypto.com. And we'll try to get him on as soon as we can so that we can dive deeper into this topic. So without further ado, here's Nicolas Courtois. So I will uh, tell you about cryptographic security of Bitcoin focusing on ECDS. Okay, so uh, uh, my profession is basically to break things. I'm a cryptologist and code breaker. Um, so I have spent my whole life in this uh, space. I'm also a Bitcoin activist, so I run a uh, Bitcoin seminar in uh, central London. And I have a blog, it's bettercrypto.com. You can also Google for your UCL Bitcoin seminar. It runs every week. So, um, well, the question is, is Bitcoin secure? Actually, Satoshi somewhat explicitly claimed this in his paper and on other places. Uh, so I have done some research on 51% attacks. Okay, so for example, here are some, uh, some uh, comments on my uh, paper. Okay, cryptocurrencies are programmed to self-destruct. Politically incorrect news, str stranger than fiction, usually true. Okay, it's a very, very long paper. Um, so my whole life I have tried to improve the security baseline. Okay, um, I was basically crying wolf all the time. <laughs> okay, uh, like 51% attacks, elliptic curve, open SSL, a few more today. <laughs> okay, um, it did not help. Okay, the wolf was always allowed to operate. Okay, um, so we failed to protect our data. Okay, and it's not so much about the NSA. Actually, you know, you have all these things which are behind the NSA here, which uh, really are the real problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, we failed to protect our money. Okay. So basically, there is no reasonable way to store money in today's um, economy. Okay. You are a victim of some sort of, you know, very strange people who are going to do very strange things with your money. Okay. Uh, so, one of the solutions is basically building sort of decentralized peer-to-peer -peer systems and decentralized peer-to-peer -peer society. Okay. Uh, one of the solutions is blockchain technology. Okay, so here is what a journalist from The Telegraph has recently written. 
So until recently, we have needed central bodies, banks, stock markets, blah, 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 <coughs> police forces to settle vital, vital questions. <coughs> who owns this money? Who controls this company? Who has the right to vote? And so on. Now, we have a small of piece of pure incorruptible mathematics in computer code, which allows to solve the same problems. Okay. But is cryptography incorruptible? Okay, so here is some excerpts from the last year NSA budget. The mission statement to covertly influence insert vulnerabilities into commercial public technologies. Okay. Uh, so it's quite funny, but actually, um, probably you have heard a lot about John Nash, okay, in uh, uh, maybe Ethereum with Vitalik sitting here, <laughs> okay? But John Nash also was a cryptographer or have tried to be a cryptographer. It was not a very successful. But he has written in 1955 his letter, a letter to the NSA, which was declassified very recently. And in his letter, he explains what, according to him, would be a secure crypto algorithm. And this is pretty revolutionary even today, because he believes that a uh, secure crypto algorithm is such that the security increases exponentially with the length of the key. And actually, very few crypto systems have ever achieved that. I mean, RSA is not secure in the sense of John Nash intention here. Okay, so RSA is not a secure um, a crypto system for John Nash. Okay, so a, a, an example of a secure crypto system is an elliptic curve cryptography, basically. It achieves this thing which is called exponential security. Okay? Uh, so, uh, elliptic curves are serious cryptography. I mean, how do you convince a, ba a banker that something is secure? Probably you can't, but here is a one method. Okay, so you publish cryptographic challenges, and currently, if you break the elliptic curve cryptography, you can earn like $700,000 in prizes and challenges. Okay, so this is how you convince a bank banker that something is secure. It's the only way we know. Okay, so I always like this idea of crypto challenges. And I was very naive, but I have once written and said, years ago, and uh, years before Snowden, that we should punish those who by their ignorance, incompetence, or because of a hidden agenda, put everybody's security at a great, great risk. Okay, I was very naive because these people are never ever punished and nothing but happens to them. <laughs> so, um, so, these challenges <laughs> are important. I mean, this is really how we know that something is secure. Okay, by the way, the Bitcoin elliptic curve is not included. Okay, if you break it, no price you break. Okay, so obviously, as Vitalik was, was said to me, obviously there are billions of dollars out there if you break it. <laughs> okay, but where is the honest option? Okay, <laughs> here's the honest option. Like, I mean, if you work for the NSA, you might quit and cash on this and retire. The honest option is that you put a, put a whole bunch, you get a whole bunch of Bitcoin, put it on Bitfinex, push it to negative tax leverage. Then announce your paper, then watch the price drop. <laughs> uh, well, uh, possibly. It's very interesting ideas. Also, in, in some countries, actually, you have legal right to have 10% of something you find if it's, if it's, if it's lost. But here it's not lost. So, you know, I, I don't really see an honest option, but it's an interesting idea. Okay, so, uh, so what about the Bitcoin elliptic curve? It's quite funny because, you know, the, origin of, the origins of this curve are pretty obscure. And recently, Dan Brown, who is basically the head of this uh, efficient cryptography group, which has standardized this elliptic curve in the first place, okay, has actually denied any support whatsoever for this curve. So he has written, I did not know that Bitcoin is using this curve. I'm surprised to see anybody use it. Okay, so it's, this is from last year. You should not use it, basically. Uh, and I have surveyed different industrial systems and nobody ever uses this curve. Okay, so if you compare the standard NIST curve, which is this one, which everybody uses, okay, and for example, like 7% of um, T, uh, TLS connections are uh, used, uh, use elliptic curves nowadays, but 98% of these, they use this single curve. So it's like, like, like something which almost everybody uses, Microsoft, German, French government systems, you know, EMV bank cards, Kerberos, OpenPGP, IPsec, 
and, and, and NATO military cryptography, NSA, and NIST, uh, recommend this curve, and so on and so on. Okay, uh, so um, very few people actually recommend the Bitcoin elliptic curve, and even 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 less people use it ever. I think Bitcoin is the only real single system which ever uses it. Okay, I think there is no other on planet Earth. Okay, it's quite interesting. So um, I have made a bet. You can bet with bitcoins anonymously or not anonymously is your choice. Okay, and you can bet money. Uh, so you can bet it's going to be broken within a year from today. It's a game. I don't think it's going to be broken, but it's just a game to raise the awareness of crypto in Bitcoin. Okay, uh, so you can you can bet uh, bitcoins whether yes or no it's going to be broken next. <laughs> There's a specific one. Okay. Uh, so, how much should you bet? Don't bet a ridiculous amount, please. There are some millionaires probably um, in this room or who know some millionaires. Okay. So, uh, uh, as long as we don't have 2,000 bitcoins in these bets, okay, we simply not yet know if Bitcoin ECC is broken. Okay. You don't expect serious code breakers to work for free. If they can make $700,000 elsewhere, they will not even look at the Bitcoin elliptic curve. They will tell you get lost. We have other things to do. <laughs> okay? So, as long as there isn't 2,000 Bitcoins in this bet, you absolutely cannot know if this Bitcoin curve is not already broke by, like, by somebody who is an expert. Okay? Um, so, um, because, you, you know, if somebody can break it, they rather steal bitcoins, for example, then, you know, uh, where is the honest option? There's no honest option. Okay. Uh, so, they would rather steal some bitcoins. By the way, this is possible only if your public keys reveal. Um, so, tip, use each bitcoin address only once. Everybody, I think, knows that. So, um, Bitcoin has a lot of issues, you know, um, I will skip, I let you know, uh, crypto could be broken, monetary policy is either weird or mad, you know, 51% um, attacks and double spending is actually easy, as claimed by uh, many people, including myself and Levin and so on. Uh, peer to peer network is actually collapsing, slow speed, uh, poor anonymity, uh, payment fees are not improving and so on. Okay, so Bitcoin is not in a good shape, is it? Okay. <coughs> Um, and also, Bitcoin has so far failed to achieve the most basic goal, being a decentralized peer to peer currency. This has absolutely, totally failed on this subject. Okay, if you want to know uh, more details, look at my blog uh, and so on. So basically, we need to do better than this. We need to, do, uh, to try to improve it. Okay, so uh, from the business perspective, the question is really what happens next. Okay? And we have a very interesting precedent in business, Yahoo and Google story. There was this guy who was sitting on the board of Yahoo, and on this board meeting, somebody has said, let's improve the search engine, okay? Um, you know, because we want to improve our business. And other people on this board meeting of Yahoo have said, get lost, now search is just 3% of our business, we are a major media company, etc. We don't need to improve the, the, the search engine. This is how Yahoo disappeared and the whole business was stolen by Google. Okay? So there was a like board meeting like this. So uh, the Yahoo of crypto coins, which is Bitcoin, is now waiting for Google of crypto coins to steal Bitcoin business. Okay? So maybe Vitalik will steal it or nobody knows. <laughs> okay? Um, and this purely on te technical superiority and without a single hostile shot. I mean, Google never advertised. Okay, they never done anything bad to anybody, or at least they claim so. Okay, they're just better. People switched. Okay, um, so this is an interesting question. Is it going to happen? Okay, um, well, I think this is, this is not guaranteed to happen. So this is a really a big question. This does, does not always happen. Okay, so maybe it's going to happen. Ask Vitalik what he says. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I was very naive during my whole life, you know. I always kind of considered that better security does automatically happen in the future and with more cryptography, and I thought the cryptography actually solves any problems, you know, and things like that. And typically it doesn't. Okay? 
So, um, will better security prevail? It's not obvious, and it's even less obvious in financial systems. Okay? Uh, because the right amount of insecurity, well, allows to share some insurance. Like recently, I, I, I spoken to a guy who told me that actually, you know, um, major companies in the UK are buying a lot of data from criminals about credit cards only because they will be able to blacklist them very quickly, and this is what their business is about. And it was hypothesized that actually they, uh, they are the major um, source of revenue for criminals. <laughs> okay? It's quite interesting. Um, and so, so you, you have this problem of, you know, profiting from crime, which is many companies actually do. Um, it also is good for us. I mean, it trains our survival and cybersecurity skills. Okay? It creates lots of interesting jobs for our students, okay? And possibly avoids criminals to engage in more violent crime. Maybe it's not so bad to have all this insecurity and fraud, <laughs> okay? So I'm not saying that better security always prevails. It's not obvious. So another question is, does better money prevail in general? Okay, so again, crypto engineers like me sometimes naively hope that better currencies will drive not so good currencies out of business. Okay, but there's a famous Gresham law which actually was first stated by Copernicus in 1517, uh, which says exactly otherwise. Bad money is driving good money out of business. Okay, and this is more or less what Bitcoin is. <laughs> the bad option. Okay, so Bitcoin has gained excessive popularity, not because it was technically very good, it never was, or had solid intrinsic value, or it was fast and convenient, it never was. Okay? It has thrived because it has created huge expectations which, temporarily, Bitcoin competitors could not meet. Maybe for now. Bitcoin remained the obvious choice and some sort of natural monopoly so far. So this is related to the question of network effects. So Antonopoulos, who is a former UCL student, points out that when you have this sort of technology which is kind of just good enough and it achieves this network scale, then good enough suddenly becomes perfect. It's just good enough. Okay? Uh, so he says, I don't see any altcoin displacing it. Bad news for Vitaly. <laughs> okay. Uh, if Bitcoin crashes again, according to Anonopoulos, it will be rather because we blow it by accident. And this is very likely. Okay, I mean, you know, uh, my Bitcoin client just crashes like three times per day at this moment, okay? And some Bitcoins have disappeared a few days ago and nobody can explain why. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have published this paper about program self-destruction of cryptocurrencies and Krypton have renamed my paper Bitcoin Suicide.pdf. It's not my idea, okay? Actually, my paper showed that quite possibly Bitcoin is exempt from this destruction process, it's a natural monopoly, okay? And whatever is bad with Bitcoin is even worse with most altcoins, okay? So it's not at all an obvious conclusion. Okay, um, so we, uh, we have published a few uh, papers on, on Bitcoin, we have a blog, which is bettercrypto.com, blog at bettercrypto.com. Um, um, I have also worked on the question of speed. So here is a citation um, which I have given an interview for the Financial Times. It's not true that Bitcoin is the internet of money, Bitcoin is the horse carriage of money because it's so badly slow, you know. Okay, so this is one of the issues. But today is really about security. Okay, let's keep this one. But the funny thing about Bitcoin is there is an interesting in relationship in Bitcoin between security and speed. I have spent my whole life in cybersecurity, and security and speed are always opposites in cybersecurity. And here it's not like this. It's very, very strange and interesting. So I claim that security implies speed in Bitcoin. Why? Because, you know, um, um, the only reason why people are not accepting Bitcoin transactions instantly is out of fear of various attacks, which do not happen so frequently. Okay, if you improve the security, you could instantly have high frequency trading on Bitcoin, on current Bitcoin, with like um, maybe microsecond transactions, maybe even faster. Okay, you could have that on current Bitcoin. 
Okay, so it's, it's a peculiar sort of situation, which I'm not used to. Okay, so, uh, well, probably everybody knows about everything about Bitcoin, so I will skip the introduction. Um, I'll just make a few remarks. So you have, um, you know, in Bitcoin you have these things which are called wallets, and it's either a file or a program, which is also called a wallet. Uh, so I skip the explanations. Uh, Bitcoin is a public key cryptography-based currency. Um, um, you have the blockchain. I think everybody knows how blockchain works. Okay, you have Bitcoin addresses. Uh, it's validated like 10 minutes or more, so it's pretty slow. Okay, and basically this uh, process of transferring Bitcoins is a process which is based on digital signatures. You have these transactions with several inputs, several outputs, and each of the inputs for the transaction has to be digitally signed. Okay? So it's, everything is underpinned by this digital signature scheme. If it's broken, all your bitcoins will be stolen. Okay, so I skip some slides here. I want to talk about other things. Okay, so if you look at these um, signature scripts, okay, uh, well, they are composed of a, a ECDSA signature, okay, so it's, there is R and S, and then you have the public key, which is typically revealed at this moment. Okay, and the interesting part here is this, this uh, R, which is, which is a RAM. Okay, okay, but actually it's not the random that you actually generate as a random. Okay, you normally generate a random, then you apply elliptic curve operation, and this is the second random which you obtain, and this one is this is the one which is going to be published. And this has very important consequences because uh, it's not obvious that if your random generator is bad, that you will actually see it so easily on the blockchain because of this operation which is being applied after the random number generation. And this is one of the crucial problems in our recent research. Okay, um, so they are obviously thefts. They are, they are thefts due to bad randoms. So uh, this question was first publicized by one of the Bitcoin developers, Neil Schneider, um, in January 2013. For example, this random is repeated more than 50 times in the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, and interestingly, it was used twice by the same user. Okay. And actually, it's possible to see that if you use the same random by the same user, it's very easy to break. Actually, Niels already publishes a formula how to compute the private key, and you can steal the bitcoins instead. Okay, so this has been uh, already done, and it's, it's not very complicated. Uh, it's, not, it's much more complicated if the same random is used by two different users. Okay, uh, so... This sort of events have been happening for years, and uh, for some time they have stopped. Like in the August 2013, there was like the last event of the sort, the Android bug was fixed, and everybody in Bitcoin thought that we are secure against this sort of things. Okay? And actually, um, if you look at uh, simple uh, signatures, like without multi-signature, uh, there, were, there, were, there was no other events in the Bitcoin blockchain since that time. Okay? But now, something interesting happened. So, so by the way, there are thefts. For example, it was reported that some, somebody has stolen 55 Bitcoins using this method. And the funny thing, it's still there. So, if, so the guy is not kind of afraid of how to spend it, you know? He's afraid of touching this money. It's still sitting on the blockchain, even today. <laughs> Okay, so it's because it became so famous, the guy is really afraid of, you know, going there and spend this money. Okay, so it's still there. Um, but now, recently, there was a second major outbreak in May 2014. Lots of, lots of events, huge numbers. Okay, and they are still happening, like, uh, last month, you know, they are, these, these things are still happening. Okay, so... Uh, so the, it's, it, it's, it has not stopped, and there is a lot more events in 2014 than 2013. Okay, uh, so here is an example of a recent bad random from September last month. Okay, it appears eight times in block this number, 322.925. Okay, however, it's used by different users. 
Okay? So it's not obvious how would you, you would steal bitcoins. It's possible to see that each of these users can steal the other users' bitcoins. That's correct. But it's not that like everybody can steal bitcoins. Okay? Potentially it's the same person. If it's the same person, there's no risk. I mean, it's, you can just steal your own bitcoins. <laughs> okay? It's the same app, you know, then there is no risk. Yes. Yeah, so isn't it uh, smart to try to discover which app it is? And then once you know which it is, so you just use all the apps, generate uh, transactions out of them? Yes, so if you have the source code of this app, and if you can reproduce the randomness, then it's much worse. Then you can steal all the bitcoins. Okay. Absolutely, I agree. Okay? But it's not something that it's necessarily is to, to do. Okay? Yes. Okay? So at this moment, the, uh, it's not always so dangerous. Okay? So what is the question? Okay, so here comes our recent research. So in uh, all the bad random attacks published so far, um, uh, um, we had the situation that only very few, few users were concerned. Basically, like one person can steal the other people, the other person's bitcoins, and that's it. Okay, so only like hundred accounts in history of Bitcoin, few hundred accounts are concerned by these problems. And, and many of these accounts are zero, have zero bitcoins at this moment. Okay, money have been already moved elsewhere. Okay, so um, you might think it's a low risk attack. Okay, so now I will explain why this is actually a very very important attack. So this is the new discovery, and it's really really scary. And it's going to be published in a few days. So actually, um, in our research, we show that under certain conditions, all bitcoins in cold storage can be stolen. And uh, so, actually, millions of accounts are potentially affected by this vulnerability. Okay, it's like, it's like a combination attack of two different vulnerabilities. So here is the new paper; it should be available within like uh, one week. I have just submitted to ePrint server yesterday. Okay. Um, so, um, is there a fix, by the way? So there is one, it's widely known, okay, so RFC 6979 by Toma Porna, okay. Um, so if you have applied this, uh, many people, some people have done ages ago, it's no problem, okay. However, if you have not applied this, we claim that no existing cold storage solution, which have not applied this patch, can claim to resist to our attacks. We claim that it's inherently hard to know that all bitcoins can be stolen by this attack, probably before it's too late. Because the attack has this offline stage, which is inherently difficult but not in, uh, infeasible, and somebody with a large computing power just do it ahead of you, and they will detect a suitable events and steal all your bitcoins from the whole security domain. So it could be like, with one single attack, you will steal bitcoins from millions of accounts, potentially. Okay, um, so which systems are affected? Well, um, you know, I, I don't have a very good picture about this. You need to talk to different developers. So, for example, this RFC is already applied by Electrum, Multibit, and Trezor, and a few other. Uh, but there are some people who are, you know, very, very strangely unpatched, like blockchain.info is secure at this moment, and they rely on you know, uh, OpenSSL, I mean, can you trust OpenSSL? It's ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bitcoin Core, apparently a patch was submitted like January 2014, and it's kind of still there waiting, waiting to be applied. It's very strange. I don't really understand exactly what happened, so what is going on with that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if you, if you want to know details about this, um, this uh, software questions, I'm not really an expert, you know, uh, but um, uh, there is a, uh, our Italian friend actually, a co-author, has made a presentation about this in Malaysia two days ago, and so he knows a bit more than me on this topic, okay, because he has like, spent more time inspecting the source code. So, um, um, and so, uh, 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 so, so this is everything that I know about this um, applicability of these attacks. Yes, questions? Can you explain briefly how the attack works? Uh, I think it's not a topic for today. It's, it's a combination attack 
which uses hardware deterministic wallets and VIP032, okay, and bad random events in combination to break all accounts in a given security domain or even all accounts in several uh, security domains simultaneously. And is it also um, an attack on that randomness or something? Yes, or? Uh, yes, absolutely. It requires bad randomness. How can you attack all randomness at once? Uh, Isn't that just the root because thing? you know? Um, it, uh, again, it's not really a topic for today, but um, because this uh, this uh, key management systems, which are very very w widely used in the Bitcoin community, are excessively fragile. I mean, they are such that a small security in the incident in a remote corner of your system compromises the whole. The, it's, it's really, really bad. Okay, so the, the, the fault also lies in this key management standards uh, specified by Peter Well and uh, Peter Well and uh, Greg Maxwell, who are the kind of you know inventors of these things. And these things are really, really fragile. They are kind of secure except that very fragile. It's like, a, it's like a minefield. You just move one centimeter to the right or to the left, you explode. It's super, super dangerous. And this RFC thing, is, a, is it a fix that fixes... Um, <laughs> it fixes the bad random, random generation problem. So it's just random, random, way to uh, random numbers. Well, it's basically a deterministic way to, good, um, to, to get random numbers, so therefore you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good fix against kind of all but random uh, attacks, yes. So if I understand correctly, if blockchain.info patches it, everybody yes. needs to send their bitcoins to a new patch address? Well, they should do it for you, yeah. basically, yes. They, they should force you to do it, otherwise yeah. most people will never do it. <laughs> okay, this is what people with Android apps have done. Previously, they have just forced every user to change, that they automatically transfer bitcoins, you know. If, yes. I, if I take a coin and I flip it 100 times, mm -hmm. would that be a good random or can that be broken too? Uh, yes, it should be a good random if you, if you take a physical coin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But deterministic randomness is even better than real randomness. Okay, because, you know, real randomness could be hacked. Okay, so for example, it's widely known that the NSA have uh, infected a lot of uh, you know, uh, firmware for hard drives. So, for example, if you have your Bitcoin app, which is using OpenSSL, what the, uh, what the hard drive does, on behalf of the NSA, to replace on the fly the OpenSSL DLL which you load, by another specially crafted one, which has a better NSA-compatible uh, random number generator. <laughs> okay? So it's one of the po ways to, 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 to bridge it. Okay? So, um, uh, like, if it's, if it's a Bitcoin smart card, you will basically, as an attacker, hug the random number generator physically and disable it, okay, and then, and then you can break, and you can extract all the keys from the smart card, and so on, okay? So, really, the deterministic method uh, specified by Thomas Bona in this standard is really better than any, even like a real random method. Okay, um, so uh, that's it for today. So really it's a survey of different uh, questions relating ECDSA in Bitcoin. Do we have additional questions? I am here to answer. I think the conference is over, so we have time. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Uh, it's far, 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 uh, far, far, far. Perhaps the question on everyone's mind is, where do we need to put our Bitcoins in order to be secure? <laughs> <laughs> Electrum treasure multi-bit? <laughs> well, I cannot answer this question. I'm, uh, nobody has paid me to advertise a specific solution. <laughs> yes. Uh, you did this bad thing where you can do the bitcoins, and if you break it, you get a bit. Um, you can bet yes or no. But sorry, sorry, what? The, the bet you did. The uh, bet, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Will Bitcoin be broken by 2015? Yes, yes, by <laughs> September 2015. Um, but what is the incentive to vote yes, because if, if it's broken, the Bitcoins you, you win are worthless. So. It's, 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 it's a game, I mean, really, you know. Maybe you think it's not broken, but you will vote it will be broken. For example, there was a bet on Scottish referendum. And, you know, my reasoning was, you know, if Scotland becomes independent, it will have a lot of bad effects on my life. 
Okay, so I have bought, but I have made a bet on yes, they would, it would become independent. Okay, because then I would get some compensation. So I have bet against my idea. Okay, that you know, I, I thought it will not happen, but I, 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 yes, but yet I have bet that it will become independent because then I would get some compensation from the bet. Uh, knowing that it, it, it will have a lot of bad consequences for me if but Scotland yeah, becomes in independent. This case, your compensation will be zero. Compensation. Yeah, whatever. But you know, it's, uh, it's not obvious that when you bet on such a system, that you really bet according to what you think. It's not true. So you vote it. Okay, but it's, it's a game. It's a game which is meant to raise the awareness about cryptography in the Bitcoin community, which is pretty low, uh, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, yes? What do you think about uh, quantum computers? I mean, in theory, they could break... Yeah, they could break all, the, all this stuff, yeah. Do you yeah. think that uh, even, I mean, if this will be happen, I mean, this, if they could break... Bitcoin. Yes, so, so actually there are already post-quantum solutions to fix Bitcoin. And actually Vitalik sitting behind you actually has proposed one in 2013. Okay, so uh, it's possible to build Bitcoin without any public cryptography whatsoever based only on hash functions. And hash functions are already naturally post-quantum things which are secure against uh, kind of normal uh, quantum computers like Shor's algorithm. So they are still quantum shortcuts on hash functions, but they are not like going from exponential to polynomial. They are like going from one exponential to another exponential. Okay, so you could have a secure Bitcoin even if everybody has a quantum computer on their home. Okay. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have a lot of comments, so I won't go about it. I only said that this is a very fun talk because you, you speak about a lot of different topics and they are all interesting. But there are a lot of stuff that I disagree with that you said. Uh, for example, you said that uh, Bitcoin is quite slow uh, because it needs a 10 minute confirmation time. In yes. practice, you don't need it. Uh, I mean, this is, there are a lot of ways that I want to easily see if a uh, transaction will be double spam or not. So it's not an issue in practice in the neighborhood. Well, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not for us to decide. It's, it's a crowding out problem, you know. Bitcoin has so many problems, and each of these problems makes space for Bitcoin competitors, you see. So it's a question of Google of Bitcoins, is it coming or not? <laughs> yeah, but this one, uh, specifically for me, it's not a problem. Uh, I know you said uh, a lot of people use Bitcoin. Uh, for can I complete this prison, you know, because uh, people, uh, it makes research for people, people are stupid, they want to be act. Uh, I think Okam Razor say either people do not know the issue with Bitcoin security or simply there is no big security issue. Uh, when you said that the other uh, cryptography algorithm was better, uh, the argument you make <coughs> is that it's used by, by a lot of uh, software, but this is not an argument because you have a lot of bad security algorithms. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a good point. But the thing is that, like somebody has said, actually Antonopoulos has said this, you know, if Bitcoin elliptic curves is broken, like everybody's in trouble. And he yes. has cheated uh, you, and it's not true. Because, you know, and so, so the least elliptic curve is such that if it gets broken, everybody's in trouble, and not only Bitcoin. But currently the situation is that if Bitcoin elliptic curve is broken, you know, cryptographers will laugh at you and will tell you, you know, you have been an idiot because, you know, uh, uh, everybody knew in cryptography that this elliptic curve is dodgy. And I think you will not meet a, a single professional cryptographer on planet Earth who will recommend this curve to you. Maybe. Not a single one. But I think that's on Bitcoin, you have the biggest incentive of all the cryptography algorithm. I mean, uh, the pot of gold is right there and it's huge. I mean, there's... But where is the honest option? I don't want to steal Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about this. I'm sure you are the dishonest picture of as well. <laughs> yes, next question. I don't know if it's true, but a while back I heard that there were vulnerabilities in the, the R version of the... Well, the R version is still not okay according to some experts. Like Berenstein still does not put it on the list of safe curves. But again, it's much better than anything else because this is like if it's broken, everybody's in trouble. 
Okay, so this is so this is this is really like at least for best practices, it's it's what uh, you know. So it's it's certainly much much better than Bitcoin MT curve. It's not ideal, of course, and you could have a better MT curve. Some people have already done it, like Stellar. They have a different MT curve. They say they have changed um, in July. They have abandoned the Bitcoin MT curve, and many other people are following suit. So you know, it's it's, it's happening. Uh, yes, is that done on the basis of? There might be something wrong with the K version, or is it just to be in a space that... It's, it's basically right? dodgy cryptography, like if you talk to cryptographers, the standard kind of uh, approach is to never ever use something like this, because, uh, you know, unless you have to. So no cryptographer would recommend it, because it's a special curve, and we have learned for ages in cryptography that special typically means broken like at least 50% like of the time. Um, and this one, you know, it's, it's actually already broken in the theoretical sense. It is already a, an attacker faster than like the normal elliptic curve, but it's, you know, it's just slightly faster. And currently, no expert believes that it could be really much, much faster. I do believe that it's going to be really much, much faster, but I'm a minority, okay? So, but, but kind of, you know, state of the art in cryptography would be to never ever use something like this because it's fundamentally dodgy. Now, people use this sort of curves when they need something like pairings, you know, so in the fancy cryptography side, like if you want to sh very short signatures, um, you know, uh, you want to have really advanced cryptography, then people do use such curves. But for normal cryptography, you should not take chances. Okay, because it's like, Actually, the public cryptography is a very interesting technology. It's a disruptive technology. The British Secret Service were the first to actually invent it. They have not published. Okay, so Americans, like uh, uh, Rivers Shamir and Merkel, etc., they have published. And, um, and public cryptography is inherently fragile. So I have spent many, many years of my life inventing new public crypto systems. I have 20 papers published about this. And most of public crypto systems ever invented were always broken. RSA is also broken in some sense. It's not exponentially secure and so on. Okay? So uh, basically, public cryptography is very fragile. Okay? And uh, my personal view is that every public crypto system will be broken always after a number of years, 10, 50 years maybe. Okay? Uh, I mean, in the sense that it would be much faster than everybody would think it would be. Okay, so, uh, you know, like, uh, you can build a block cipher, hash function, whatever, an idiot, anybody can build a block cipher, hash function, which will be secure enough. Okay, um, uh, a monkey could do it. Okay, public cryptography is a different sort of technology. It's a place where experts fail with probably like 50 or 60 percent, the best experts on our planet. Amateurs fail probably close to one. Okay, so it's it's really like a rare animal. It's it's a rare animal. These public crypto systems which are secure, there are extremely few of them, and even those are broken after a number of years. Like even at, at these elliptic curves with like you know seven hundred thousand dollar prices, half of them are already kind of hypothetically broken in theory. Okay, so you know it's uh, public cryptography is just collapsing every year. And it's, it's like if you were the history of cryptography, you have to learn from history, you will understand how it works. It's, it's, it's inherently, it, you have the, this kind of, you know, um, um, minefield thing, which is that, you know, uh, you do a small mistake and you explode it. Like, it took, it really took us really years to understand how to use RSA. Properly. Most variants, most industrial variants of um, uh, public cryptography have been broke, like most, I mean, at least 90%. Okay? So at least 90% of um, industrial public cryptography systems which were proposed were broken in the coming years, in some sense, more or less strong. Okay? So it's, it's, uh, public cryptography is inherently difficult to do. And this is going to always be so. So I hope you enjoyed this talk by Nicolas Courtois. I thought it was very interesting and also refreshing to hear somebody come forth and point out some of the potential flaws in the technology. 
Now, if you want to support the show, there are multiple ways you can do that. You can start by leaving us a review on iTunes, and you can also leave us a tip at epicenterbitcoin.com slash tips. And we want to thank all of those who have been supporting the show through their donations. If you want to stay up to date, you can follow us on Twitter at EpicenterBTC. You can also find us on Facebook and Google+. And for those of you who are not up to date, you should know that we're now doing live Google Hangouts in which you can interact with guests and ask your questions on Twitter and in a Q&A module. And we usually announce those Hangouts just a few days before they happen on all our different social media platforms. In fact, as I record this, we're getting ready to do a live interview with David Johnston, who is an investor, technologist, he's managing director of the DAPS Fund, a board member of the MSC Protocol Foundation, as well as the co-founder of the BitAngels Network. And so that interview will come out on Monday, November 3rd. So be sure to look out for that on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and everywhere you are used to finding us. So thanks again for listening, and we look forward to being back on Monday.